But then he said, Tan Huang, uh, Tan. And then, uh, you know, my name is James, so in Chinese it's called Jian Tan. <laughs> Jian Tan means fried egg. <laughs> and then we have another uh, uh, pastor in the church, his name is called Paul Tan. So, Po Tan, Po Tan Liao, Jiu Jian Tan. Po Tan means broken egg, so after you break the egg, then you can fry the egg. <laughs> yeah. I think in a lot of situations in life, it doesn't necessarily go as planned. When there are challenges, when there are difficulties, when there are disappointments, when what lies ahead of us seems to be an insurmountable problem, how do we feel? How do we respond to such situation? I think it's very common for us to respond with fear, to respond even with frustration, disappointment, anger. And sometimes when we are in this kind of situation for a prolonged period, we may even go into depression. So what should we do in such times? Is there a way out? And this morning, when we look at a conversation Jesus had with a father that was very desperate, and as we go along the conversation, we notice that Jesus points out something that is very critical, that is very important. And to Jesus, this is the one key that can unlock him from his situation to help him to go from being afraid to being hopeful, to go from being depressed to being cheerful, to go from a time of frustration to a time of joy and delight. So this morning, we want to enjoy, uh, uh, to 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 explore this passage and then to look at why is Jesus, why did Jesus say what he said and how we can tap on those principles and make it a part of our lives so that in times of challenges and difficulties, instead of feeling fearful, instead of feeling frustrated, we can feel confident and cheerful. What is the background of the story? This is taken from Mark chapter 9, verses 14, all the way to verse 29, where this story is recorded. But let me just quickly give you the background. Here you have a desperate father. You have a desperate father because he has a demon-possessed son. And when Jesus asked him, how long has this been? The father's reply was, from childhood, since childhood. That is to say, he has been going through this problem for a long, long time. He didn't say from last week. He didn't even say from last month. He did not say from last year. He did not say last two years. It is like it's been there too long, from as long as he can remember. And when this child is demon-possessed, he will fall to the ground, he will foam at his mouth. He will also try to throw himself into water and fire. And so it's a very dangerous demon possession. It is the very serious kind where the boy can lose his life. I want you to imagine that if you have a child who is demon possessed like that, or if you have a child that, is, that, that has almost like a permanent disability, or a child who is very sick, what would you do as a father? What would you do as a mother? Would you just say, okay, I know he's really suffering. There's nothing much I can do and therefore do nothing? Of course not. I think every father and every mother would do whatever they can, whatever that is in that their power to help to bring some kind of relief to the child, if not total cure for the child. And so I believe this father would have gone and sought out every physician that could possibly help the child. He had gone to every religious leader that seems to have some form of ability to bring relief to the child. But thus far, he has been disappointed time and time again. And one day, he heard the news about this new kid on the block, Jesus Christ. And so he probably spent time travelling, bringing his son, wanting to see Jesus to see if Jesus can do something for his son. But when he arrived at that particular place, 
Jesus was nowhere to be found because Jesus had gone out to the mountains, to the Mount of Transfiguration. You remember that story? And with him, he took along Peter, James, and John. And what the, peop- the disciples that was left behind was the other nine. Jesus had that wonderful time in the mountains with his disciples, basking in the glory of God. We all need time like that. That is why we have the camp. Come and join us for the camp. <laughs> all that is just for the advertisement. Now for the real message. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, 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 Jesus happened to come down and notice that this father, together with the religious leader, was having a quarrel with the disciples. We have no insight as to what they were quarreling about. And so Jesus started to talk to the father to try to understand what happened. And that's where we have this conversation that is recorded for us in Mark chapter 9, verse 22 to 24. And so the father said, it has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. If you are not careful, if you do not pay attention to him, if you do not guard over him, he can lose his life. And what is very interesting is that in the same story in the book of Luke, It gives us further insight as to the relationship between the father and the child because this son is actually his only son. And when you have an only, when when this person, when your son is the only son, your only child, whatever happens to him becomes all the more important to you. And so he came and he said to Jesus, if you can do anything, Take pity on us. Help us. Verse 23 says, If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Our focus this morning is to look at these three phrases or statements that are highlighted in yellow or orange. (laughs) If you can do anything from the Father's mouth, if you can from Jesus' mouth, everything is possible for him to believe. And verse 24, where the Father says, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we just want to give thanks and praise to you. Thank you for this wonderful day that we can come and just long for you. Indeed, Lord, you are the God who helps us. You are the God who brings breakthrough in our life. You are the God who encourages us. You are the God that comforts us. And Father, we know you are here. And we pray that you continue to speak to us, especially to brothers and sisters who are going through tough times, who are on the verge of giving up, who does not know what else to do because everything they have tried has come to a dead end. But there's no hope and there's no solution in sight. Father, when there's no way, you are our way. When there's no path in the desert, you will open up a path because there's nothing impossible for you. So brothers and sisters, do you feel like you are in the same situation as the father? It may not be that your son is demon-possessed, but it could be that your son is not well. It could be Physically, you are not well. It could be the relationship that you have with your spouse is not well. It could be the problems that you face in your companies and somehow things does not seem to be going well. You've tried everything you can and and nothing seems to be working. What can you do? So the father was really desperate and he came to Jesus and said this, If you can do anything, Please help us. Please be kind to us. He seems to be very disappointed because the Father has tried out the disciples of Jesus. And the disciples of Jesus could not do anything, could not bring any relief to the Son. Now the Master has come 
He's probably have certain doubts in his heart at this present moment. Since your disciples cannot do anything, I'm not sure whether you as the master can really do anything. You see, you notice his word, he didn't say, if you can heal my son, please do it. If you can set my son free, please do it. He has already discounted his expectation. Anything also can, as long as you improve his condition. And basically, the father has this mentality. My son is the problem. He's demon-possessed, so he's the problem. And Jesus, you are the one that I'm turning to. What I heard about you, you are the problem solver. So the father comes, brings the son. I found Jesus. Bring the son to Jesus. This is the problem. This is the problem solver. Problem solver, this is the problem. Now get to work. And so he think that, okay, I've made the connection. My job as a father is done. And so he pushes the whole issue about his son's deliverance to Jesus, basically asking a very important question. Are you powerful enough? If you are powerful enough, my son will be delivered. If you are not powerful enough, I have to start all over again. But Jesus' response was very interesting because Jesus latches on to what the Father say, but uses it in a slightly different tone. If you can, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by if I can? You see, everything is possible for him who believes. With this statement, Jesus suddenly turned the table. Jesus is saying, hey, actually, uh, the problem is not with me. You know. It's not whether I can or I cannot. Because the fact of the matter is, I can, I can. What do you mean by if you can? But you know where the problem is? The problem is with you. Do you have enough faith? You see, to get something to make something happen, to resolve an issue, to resolve a problem based on this scripture. We need to recognize that, yes, there's a problem to be solved, the demon-possessed son. Yes, there's a problem solver that is important. We must have the right problem solver. If the problem solver is not powerful enough, not wise enough, then nothing will happen. But another factor which we often overlook that is also very, very important. In fact, it is key in this story is the faith of the presenter. The faith of the person who brings the problem to Jesus. And so Jesus said to him, everything is possible for him who believe, basically asking him the question, do you believe? Do you have faith? Why is faith so important? Why did Jesus highlight this issue of faith? You see, in Mark chapter 9, verse 19, in the same passage, when Jesus heard about how the disciples were not able to deliver the demon-possessed son, Jesus made this statement, O unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. And so Jesus identified The reason why the disciples could not set the son free, could not bring liberty to the demon-possessed son, was an issue of faith. So faith has to do with deliverance. Faith is necessary in deliverance. Then in Mark chapter 5, verse 36, you have the story of Jairus' daughter. Jairus is the ruler of the synagogue. The daughter was very ill. And so Jairus went to see Jesus and said, Jesus, please come to my house. My daughter is very sick. Please do something for her. And Jesus gladly went along with Jairus. Halfway, there was a large crowd that was pressing in on Jesus. And suddenly, Jesus stopped and said, Who touched me? The disciples were incredulous. What do you mean by who touched you? Everyone is touching you. (laughs) But Jesus said, that touch was different. That touch was different because I felt power flow out from me. 
And as Jesus asked, who touched me? This woman responded, probably feeling a sense of guilt, not knowing, not sure what Jesus, why Jesus asked the question, who touched me? But she was honest enough to respond and say, it is me, it is me. Jesus had no intention to rebuke her, but only had the intention of affirming her and comforting her. And so in Mark chapter 5, verse 34, he said to her, daughter, your faith, notice, your faith has healed you. Jesus did not say, you are healed, I've healed you. Jesus said, your faith has healed you. Yes, that is the master who carries the power. Where did the power come from? From Jesus. So when the woman touched Jesus, power flow out from Jesus to her. But why did the power flow out through her and not to all the other people that was touching Jesus? I'm sure everybody who touched Jesus at that time had some kind of problem, some kind of issue in their lives, in their family, in their circumstances. But Jesus was sensitive enough to this one touch because this one touch was a different touch. This one touch was a touch of faith. And when faith was exercised in that touch, because she feel that if only I can touch even just the hem of his garment, something can happen to me. And Jesus applauded her for her faith. So you see, faith has to do with healing. Whose faith? Not Jesus' faith but the faith of the person that was carrying the burden, the faith of the person that was in trouble. And after this, was, after this happened, they continued on their journey. And as they progressed in their journey, the servants of Jairus' household came and said to Jairus, don't trouble the master anymore. Your daughter is dead. How do you think Jairus would feel? Oh, no. He would be very, very sad. And the Bible says, ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. The fear that must have gripped the father's heart, I have lost my daughter. The worst that can happen to me has happened. And what can you do after a person has died? Nothing. Nothing. But Jesus told Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. That is to say, the faith of Jairus will be able to help him overcome his fear. If he has faith, then he will not have fear. What about the disciples in the storm? In Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, it says, He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The disciples were all in a boat, including Jesus. They were sailing from one part of the Sea of Galilee and to another part of the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee is known to have very powerful storms from time to time. Because the Sea of Galilee is at a very low level and on the sides are mountains and when the wind comes over, especially from the eastern side, then it will come with such a force and cause a storm in the sea. And the boat was totally out of control. You must remember that there were at least four fishermen in the boat, Peter and Andrew, James and John. And they were people from the Sea of Galilee and so they knew the sea very well and they know how to navigate the boat. But even at that time, they did not know what to do. The boat was probably going to break apart, the boat was probably going to capsize and the disciples were afraid. That was when Jesus told them, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? What is it trying to tell us? The reason why you are so afraid is because you have so little faith. What if you reverse it and say, you, are, you have so much faith, would you still be so afraid? No. Your fear will be much less or probably have no fears at all. 
So you can see all these people were in desperate situation. Their sickness, their problems, their family members are not well. They are in a desperate situation which might cost them their life, which might cause their business to go bust. And the issue that Jesus pointed out is, if you want to come out from all this, you need to have this one key. You need to have faith. So watch many says, faith looks not at what happens to him, but at him whom he believes. Very often we are fearful because we are looking at our circumstances. We are looking at our problems. We are looking at the difficulties. We are looking at the dead ends. We are looking at the lack of solution. And the more we look, the more hopeless we feel, the more frustrated we feel, and we are angry with the people who bring such problem to us. And so watch many say, instead of looking at the problem, we need to look at Jesus. When we have faith, we turn to Jesus. And when we see Jesus, when we see God, in God, there is all the solution. I feel that faith is like a channel that connects you to all of God, to all, to who God is, to what God has, and to what God is able to do. And so when you have faith, when you believe, when you're connected with this powerful being that knows all things, that can do all things, that can solve all problems, you know how you'll feel? you feel at peace. you feel at rest. Let me give you an example. How many of you here have ever sat on a chair and as a result of you sitting on the chair, you broke the chair or the chair is broken because you sat on it? Any one of you? Wow, I've got some friends here. I've broken at least three chairs in my life. The first time was many, many years ago. Totally unexpected. I was visiting people during Chinese New Year. And so almost every seat in the house was taken. I took a seat. It was, in actually, it was actually in Lydia Go's house. I sat on this chair, you know, a, a wooden chair, and I was drinking my, my Chinese New Year tea. And suddenly the chair gave way, boom, and I was on the floor, just directly down. I didn't even fall by the side, it just boom went down. I said, oh no. <laughs> that was the start of the chair-breaking ministry. I sat in a chair in the office in the church, you know, those swivel chairs underneath, there's plastic, the five wheels. And one day I was just sitting, 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 and I was leaning back, and one of the legs just gave way and broke. I said, that was my second one. The third one happened in my house my own chair, also a swivel chair, and same thing happened. The legs gave way and broke, and then I fell. So, because of these negative experiences with chair, I don't trust chairs. I have no faith in chairs. So, every time I go to a place, I need to test the chair out. I'm particularly afraid of those plastic chairs, you know, the ones that they use in the restaurant. And sometimes when I sit on the chair, the chair just just sort of melt under my weight. The legs go four ways. And I have to be very careful. I will have to use my own two legs to hold the legs in so that I can continue sitting on the chair. Another way of overcoming this is to put another chair on top so you're sitting on two chairs. The four legs of the outside chair will hold the four legs of the inside chair together and so that it becomes stronger. So if you are in that situation, try that. And so I am very doubtful as to the strength of the chair that every time I sit on a chair, I have anxiety. I don't have anxiety attack, I just have anxiety. I feel I cannot fully trust the chair. I cannot be at rest. I sit down and then I just watch, wait for a while and see. And very often, if I don't trust the chair, I have to use my own leg as some kind of support. So instead of putting 100% weight on the chair, I put maybe about 70 or 80%. And the rest, I try to bear with my own legs. But if I were to discover a strong chair, I test it, I lift up my leg and say, hey, this one can take my weight, no problem. Then I am at total rest. I'm at peace. I am comfortable. 
You see, that's the same thing with God. When we realize how strong, how powerful God is, that God can truly take care of the issue that we are going through, or at least give us the ability to cope with the situation we are in, that's when we are no longer afraid. That's when we are no longer frustrated. That's when we are no longer disturbed and we can be at rest. So when Jesus said to the men, if you can, everything is possible for him who believes. You know what the men say? The men exclaimed, the men shouted out. The Bible says he cried out. In the New King James Version, the Bible tells us that the man had tears in his eyes. He says, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. What a paradox. What do you mean by you believe and you don't believe at the same time? I do believe. But actually, I have unbelief. What does it mean? I mean, I think this is what it means. I believe, I do believe, but it is not enough. At the same time, I see the desperation of the Father. Whatever you want me to do, whatever you say that I need to perform, I need to have in order for you to heal, to set my son free, I will do it. And if you say faith is the condition, everything is possible for him who believes, then I will tell you, I believe. I will tell you first, then think about whether I truly believe. If you tell me I need to jump, I will ask you how high. If you tell me I need to bow down, I'll do it right here because he is desperate. He's been looking for a cure. He's looking for a solution for the son and he has not found one. And so when Jesus said, if you have faith, if you believe it is possible, his immediate response probably didn't really think about it. He immediately said, I do believe. And subsequent to that, he's also an honest fellow. But, 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 help me overcome my unbelief. I know I believe, but it doesn't seem to be enough. I, I want to say I believe, and indeed I do. That's why I come to see you. That's why I bring my son to you. But if you ask me, am I fully convinced? I cannot say I do. There are still doubts in me. I think he's being very honest. Aren't we all like that? How many of us can say that I'm fully convinced with everything that God says? I think this is a very common dilemma. If I were to ask you, do you, believe, do you believe in God? All of us would say yes. Do you believe that God can do great things? And we would say yes. Do you believe that God can do great things through believers? Yes. Do you think that God can do, do you believe that God can do great things through you right now? Then we will go, uh... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, but, uh, but uh, you know, that is where we have, I do believe. Help me in my unbelief. This statement also highlights an understanding of what faith is. Faith is more than just have or don't have. Of course, you can be in a situation where you don't have faith. You can also be in a situation where you have faith. But at the same time, we need to understand that faith is a variable. Faith can become stronger or can become weaker. It is like a muscle. If we exercise it more, it becomes stronger. If we don't exercise it as much, then it will become weaker. And so faith is not something that is fixed, something that is stationary. It is something that is variable. And so the man is saying, yes, I do believe, but I only have a little faith. My faith, my belief is little. My unbelief in this total realm of my faith is, is plenty. So brothers and sisters, if faith is so important, and many of us are in this same dilemma as the man, I do believe, but 
I have unbelief. I have faith, but I'm not fully convinced. What shall we do? What can we do? How do we move from unbelief to belief? I think there are a number of ways that can help us to grow and develop in our faith. But this morning, I want to highlight what appears or what seems to be most common in the Scriptures. Look at the example of Abraham. In Romans chapter 4, verse 19 to 21, it says, Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. We all remember that God promised Abraham that he will have he will become the father of many nations. But you cannot be the father of many nations unless you start with the father of one. And so he tried through Hagar and bore Ishmael. But God says, that, that's not the one. That's not the one. It is with your wife, Sarah. That's the one that I'm waiting and looking for. And he waited and waited and waited. And he waited from 75 until he was 99 years old. And so at 99 years old, he said, cannot lah, too old lah. Those days, people live a longer age. Maybe, you know, they can still give birth, uh, can still impregnate the woman after a number of years, even when they're older. But, but, but Sarah was already 90 years old at that time. <laughs> give birth at 90, <laughs> getting pregnant at 90. And you see, you notice that there's a bit of difference. Abraham, his body is as good as dead. Not dead yet as good as, almost, getting there. Whereas Sarah's womb was dead. How do you know the womb is dead? For woman, it means no more menstruation. No more eggs coming out. (laughs) Cannot give birth anymore. Gone. But the Bible tells us that he continued to have faith. And what was the reason, what enabled him to have faith was because in verse 21, it says, he was fully persuaded. It is like, this is my faith. And this faith has like 10 lines. The first three lines is, yes, I believe, I believe, I believe. And then the next seven lines is, I don't believe, 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 I don't believe. But somehow in his journey with God, from the time he was 75 all the way until he was 100 years old, and through all the things that God spoke to him, somehow all his, I don't believe, 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 changed to, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. And so he was fully persuaded. And that is why when we want to grow from unbelief to believe, we must come and have conversation with God so that God can persuade us. How do we persuade someone? By talking, by sharing, by arguing. That's what I'm trying to do now. I'm trying to persuade you to say, if you have unbelief, You can go from unbelief to belief and the way to do it is by having a conversation with God. You see, Romans chapter 10 verse 17 makes it even more uh, clearer, makes it clearer. He said, consequently, faith comes through hearing the message. How does faith come? Message, words. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. Because we're not talking about faith in anything. We are talking about faith in God. And so the words must come from God. When the words come from God, when we have faith in those words, we actually have faith in God. Mark chapter 9, verse 28 to 29. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. What does it mean only by prayer? Didn't the disciples pray? Of course they did. But sometimes when we think about prayer, we think about this mono-directional prayer. I tell God what God needs to do. 
But prayer is bi-directional. We can tell God and God can tell us. We can upload our request to God. God can download His wisdom, His ways to us. And as a result, our faith begins to grow and things can start happening. Let me give you an example of how God called Moses to Egypt. When God called Moses to Egypt, Moses' initial reaction was one of great reluctance. I think all of us would do the same. Because here you have an 80 years old man who for the past 40 years spent time in the back of the desert taking care of sheep. And now God tells him, hey, I want you to go and tell the most powerful nation and tell them he better let all the slaves go. All of a sudden, you're going to lose millions and millions of free labor. You think Egypt is going to do that? And so Moses is quite smart. If I go and do that, I'm actually declaring war on Egypt. (laughs) And what kind of a chance do I have? I'm one person. And they are many, a nation. And so Moses started talking to God. And each time he talked, each time he opened his mouth, he expresses an area of doubt in his life, an area of unbelief, an area of, I look at this, I cannot do lah. And so the first thing he said to God was, but, 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 but I'm a nobody. Who am I? And God's response was, it's okay. Everyone is a nobody. It's not so important who you are, but what is more important is who is with you. And so God answered him, I will be with you. You are zero plus infinite, infinite equals to infinite. So me with you, more than enough. Let's go. But, 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 but who are you? <laughs> if I go and tell them, you know, the God of my fathers have sent me, and they ask, what is his name? You see, whenever we think about a name in those days, in this kind of context, is by whose authority are you coming? That's why when we pray to cast out evil spirits, we pray in the name of Jesus because the name of Jesus simply means in the authority of Jesus. And so, so, so under whose name am I coming? And God says, okay, I'll let you know my name. And God has a dilemma. How does God introduce himself? I am the God of the sun, but God made the sun. I'm the God of the moon, but God made the moon. I'm the God of the stars, but God made the stars. I'm the God of the, you know, all this God of the something is to try to show you relationship, is try to give you an understanding of the nature of God, of the power of the God, of the characteristics of the God. And so how do you think God, how do you think What is the most appropriate way for God to introduce himself? I'm the God of the galaxies. But even then, God was the one who made the galaxies. He spoke and it all came into being. All the galaxies, everything that you can see, pales in comparison to the greatness and the power of God. So finally, God introduced himself. I am that I am. The only person that God can justifiably compare himself with is himself. And so I say, okay, okay, you, you are who you are. Okay, got it. But, 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 but if I go there and just tell them, you, you mean they all believe? I have no power, I have nothing to convince them. And God went into a a dialogue with Moses, tell Moses, Moses, put your stuff on the ground and suddenly the stuff turned into a, uh, a snake and Moses ran away from it because he was afraid. That is to say Moses did not expect something like that to happen. And then he picked it up, it became a staff again, put his hand into his cloak, come out, leprosy. Put his hand into the cloak, come out, totally healed. And then God says, if you pour water in the river now, the whole river will become blood. So with that, he says, okay, now he's more convinced. He's more persuaded. I've got the power, okay. But, but, but even though I've got the power, I'm not gifted, I'm not eloquent, I cannot speak. 
you know, to go and try to tell the Pharaoh, Pharaoh, you better let the Israelites go. I must be able to mouth those words in a convincing way, but I can't do it. And God reminded him, he says, who made man, who gave man his mouth? Who is the creator? If your mouth cannot work, don't worry, I got spare parts because I manufacture them. <laughs> but Moses insisted, no, 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 no. I cannot speak. And so God says, okay, you cannot speak. I send someone who can speak to go with you. But you go and Aaron will go and assist you. So you see, when God called Moses, Moses had a lot of doubts. I cannot. There's a lot of unbelief. Why send me? I'm so old. You know, this is a death mission. Even if I talk, they will not be convinced. But that's provided I can talk in the first place. I cannot do it. Impossible. And God has to answer all his doubts one by one. It's okay. I will be with you. I am the great God. I'm, I am that I am. Look at the power that I've given to you. The staff can turn it into snake. You know, leprosy can be healed. It's like an incurable disease can be cured. And you have this supernatural sign. Water can turn into blood. And with regards to your ability to speak, don't worry about that because I was the one who made mouth, you know. But anyway, Aaron will go with you. And after that, not long after, the Bible says Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, let me go back to my own people. Finally, he says, okay, I will go. I will go. And that was after the conversation that God had with Moses in the early part of Exodus chapter 4. And the reason why he went was because of this last statement. Now the Lord had said to Moses in Median, go back to Egypt for all the men who wanted to kill you are dead. He probably had this last thing. Hey, there are a lot of people who want me dead in Egypt. If I go back now, before I even start on my mission, they will finish me. Then, it'll be the end. And so God knows his level of faith. Of course, if he had obeyed God and gone, God would still be able to take care of these fellas. But God knew where he was at and he says, okay, all these people is dead. Now he can go. And as a result, he really went back. You see, so what we need to do is when we have doubts, when we have unbelief, let us continue to hold on to our faith and come to God and say, God, please clear my unbelief. Let us present our doubts, those poison to God and let God grant us the words that build faith, the words that will be the antidote for our doubts so that we can be fully persuaded we can be fully convinced. And so what we need to do is to come to God and listen to Him in the way you hear best. Why do I say in the way you hear best? Because all of us receive message from God differently. For some of us, we receive messages from God. We hear what God says to us through prayer. You give the person an extended time of prayer, they will hear from God. Some people, they are very good when they are worshipping. The moment they go into a time of worship, they start to download from God. There are some people, when they read the Bible, the, the, the Word somehow ministers to them, encourages, encourages them, jumps up to them. Some people, when they, when they listen to sermon, it is in the midst of listening to sermon, not just on, in church on Sunday, but while they're driving on the way to, to work, they listen to messages from not just our church, from other churches. It doesn't matter as long as it's a godly person preaching. They also hear and it encourages them. So it doesn't matter which way you hear from God. The important thing is you must be in a place where you hear from God so that your doubts can be neutralized with the words of faith that comes from God. And for some people, dreams are very important. You know, one of the most important decisions I made in my life was because of a dream. I was on the verge of making a decision to quit studies in Singapore to come to church to serve full-time. And when I presented this to my mother, my mother broke down and cried. 
She cried for two weeks and started to tell all the leaders in the church, why you call my son to come and serve in the church? Uh, cry, 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 cry. Until all the leaders of the church says, we better have a meeting. And so they told us, you have to honour your mother. My father, they didn't say honour my father because my father says, it's up to you. You can make whatever decision you want. So my father was not in the equation. My mum was the one who says, no. That's why they need to convince her, fully persuade her. Anyway, they decided to have a meeting. And so the elders tell me, he says that, if your mum says no, you go back and study. If your mum says yes, you stay and work with us. And I was thinking like, I really want yes because I know God has called me. I want to serve God. But I also really want no because then I can go back and just study, you know, get a job, earn my money, enjoy my life. <laughs> but, but, but I must qualify this. I'm not saying I'm not having a good life, okay? I'm having a very good life. So much so that if you were to ask me at this moment, would I quit my studies and come back and serve in the church again? I would do so. Now that I've experienced what it's like serving in the church and serving God. So it's not, but at that time, I was thinking, you know, go and work, earn money, get lots of money, and then enjoy life. That would be easier. Anyway, so the meeting came. They asked my mom, Auntie, what do you say? And my mom said this, totally beyond my expectation. She said, Last night, I had a dream. I dreamt that this son of mine was dressed in white, preaching from the pulpit. I know he's called to serve God in church. Immediately, Christine Cheng's father, who was the elder of the church at that time, says, Auntie, God has spoken. You must let go of your son and let him serve in the church. My mom said, yes. Take him, lah. take him, take him. <laughs> it was like, take him, lah. he knows nothing. One, lah. If you do wrong, just scold him. <laughs> Uh, that was how I entered into my ministry Not in a glorious way Nobody clapped hands It was like, yeah <laughs> uh, Thank you, thank you <laughs> So that's how I ended up serving God You see, God can speak You know, when I had to decide Whether to go to Australia To study my theology I wasn't really thinking about it It wasn't something that I wanted to do Because I already had plans. That was 1987. I already had plans to get married in 1989. My girlfriend then is my wife now. We have already gone through all this discussion and all of a sudden, one Sunday afternoon, God says, I want you to leave Malaysia and go to a place where I'll show you. Go to Australia and there you're going to study theology and serve the Chinese. It's like, why go to Australia? Here I've got plenty of Chinese. I think there's more Chinese here than there. And I'm really studying theology. Why go there and study theology in that place? I, I couldn't understand. And God spoke to me from Genesis chapter 12. He says, go to a land I will show you. Leave your kindred, leave your nation. So I say, alama, leave your kindred, leave your nation means leave Malaysia and Singapore. Go to this Angmor place. So far away. In those days, we have not much information about Australia. So anyway, I was, I was very concerned. Where is my money going to come from? Will the church let me go? Will my girlfriend remain with me? I don't know, there are many, many issues that I was concerned for. But that night, I went to church. I came to church. It was a Friday night, I remember. Those days, we had Friday night service. You know, in the midst of praise and worship, and sometimes in the midst of praise and worship, they start to utter out prophecy, like what Bun Fei did today. Prophecy. And this prophecy was based on Genesis chapter 12. I said, oh no, God is really speaking to me. And then the short talk speaker, the one that gives a short message, like five to ten minutes, a testimony or a short teaching, he says, my text is from Genesis chapter 12. I say, ah, this one, finish, finish, finish. God is really speaking to me. And then, not, that's not all, the speaker went up and then he says, okay, this, more, this evening we're going to look at the passage in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. I said, finish, I got to go. I didn't want to go, but I knew I had to go. But it was those conversations that took away the doubts and built the faith so much so that I'm willing to say, yes, I will obey, I will go. So brothers and sisters, if you have unbelief, let God build that faith in you 
to remove all your fears, to remove all your anger, to remove all your frustration. Come to God, speak to Him, let Him speak to you and build your faith. From there, we can go from unbelief to belief. And we can experience things that are impossible made possible. Shall we pray? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. As we close our eyes and bow our heads, some of you may be going through tough times. It may be situations in your marriage. It may be situations in your family. It may be situations in your workplace. It may be even situations in the church. It may be situations in your own personal health. But whatever it is, God is big enough, God is strong enough to be able to do something either to remove the problem or to give you sufficient strength to cope with the problem. And for that, we need faith. Faith in God. Father, I want to come and pray to you, especially for all my brothers and sisters that are going through one challenge or another. They've tried many things. They've seen many people. But somehow the solution is not forthcoming. Every step they take seems to be filled with obstacles. Every path they journey down seems to come to a dead end. Like the Father we see in the Scriptures, Lord, you know how desperate they are. You know how heavy their hearts are. And God, this morning, the song we sang, that you are the God who comfort us. You are the God who does miracles. And so, God, we come to you. And Lord, we say, give us this faith. Speak to us. Build our faith. Lord, we do believe. Help us in our unbelief. Help us, Lord, so that we can grow in faith in you, to see a breakthrough in our situation or to see a breakthrough in our lives to cope with the situation. Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit to come and just in your own special way, bring that assurance to our brothers and sisters that you are aware of what they are going through and you can help. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. <laughs> Grow in faith. If you have any needs for prayer, do come to the front. We'd love to pray with you. God bless you.